Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out so early. I really do appreciate that. And do not worry, this is not going to be a heavy tech talk at all. So hopefully we do have some sci-fi fans here. I think maybe from yesterday we might. Um, I'm feeling a little bit underdressed now, given Sarah's performance. Uh, she has set a terribly high precedent there. Um, but yeah, my name is Sally Jenkinson, and today I want to be talking to you about working with the future and what this means for us as web people. So I opened up the paper that we got yesterday, and I love how right at the start, there's this mention of how our technologies are constantly changing. And today's pretty good, right? We're in quite a good place. We have loads of cool stuff available to us. But in five years' time, it's going to be absolutely amazing. So in the style of all good substitute teachers everywhere, let's watch a video. And let's have a sneak peek at what the internet of 2021 is going to be like. Ah, oh, we don't have the sound. Don't worry, it's for comedic effect. <laughs> I'm really sorry I have to stop it there due to time, but that is pretty amazing, right? Um, that is a clip from the 1995 film Johnny Mnemonic, which stars a wonderfully wooden Keanu Reeves, as you can see, and is based very loosely on a short story by William Gibson. And one of the reasons that I love this film is not only just because it's absolutely terrible, but it's also a great example of the challenges that we face when we try and work with the future, whilst also being very firmly grounded in the realities of our present. So the film's pretty well known, and unsurprisingly nowadays, you can find it in a lot of places online. And for once, the best thing about this, I think, are the YouTube comments. So you can find things like this. And because the film uses technology concepts that existed at the time, um, you get people sort of talking about them. So they mention the visor that Johnny's wearing is actually called an iPhone, which gets quoted quite a lot. And obviously, there's comparisons to Google Glass and Oculus Rift and all of those things. And there's the occasional knowing nod to the data gloves that Johnny's wearing um, became the much maligned Nintendo Power Gloves, if we had anybody here who had some of those. Yeah. Um, but people, have, uh, they focus very much on the hardware, and they sometimes take for granted things that we now accept as a given. So actually, um, in that clip, there's a, a tiny snippet of live translation feature, which is obviously something that was just mere fancy at the time. So we have this very kind of forward-thinking stylization being balanced with the limitations that nobody of that period uh, thought that we could ever get around. So things like dial-up, for instance. And this is something we see again and again when we think about technology predictions, and this can mean anything from sci-fi through to this, which is, um, I think it's a 19th, a 19th century um, German chocolate box art. And they did a series that tried to predict what the year 2000 would be like. And so <laughs> they could see this picture, like, they could picture us walking in water, right? But this is only through means that they could comprehend at the time. So we've got the, the balloons up there. And I don't know if you can see, but they're also wearing these really weird little canoe shoes as well. So I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. But that is very much the challenge, right? So how do we work with the future whilst being constrained by the realities of our present? And more to the point, why do we actually want to work with the future? Well, to answer that, we first need to understand the challenges that the future can bring us, both in the immediacy and the near future and beyond. So this is a white elephant, and white elephants were kept by Southeast Asian monarchs, and they were considered a really important status symbol and were sacred. And if you've done something really amazing, then you might be gifted a white elephant by a monarch, which 
I'm sure you'd be thrilled about because I bet we all have space for an elephant and you know, want to feed it and keep it. And the worst thing is, because they're sacred, they're protected from labor. So you kind of need to keep this thing. You can't really just put it in a drawer somewhere and get it out when the monarch comes round. And you end up with this really expensive thing that isn't much practical use at all and which you can't actually get rid of. And in the West, we often use the term white elephant to describe a very expensive burden that fails to meet expectations. Nobody actually wants their website to end up as an expensive white elephant that isn't much use, but which you can't get rid of. But the problem is, what we plan now may not necessarily be relevant in the future. So very often, we start with our discovery, and we put together our requirements and our technology choices to match that. But these are to meet needs that we understand now, in, in the present. And we do usually build in some kind of awareness, hopefully, that within our project timelines, things are going to change. But the reality is that actually a lot can change. So we really need to consider the timelines of everything else involved, which can be from the changing needs and expectations of our users through to wider business strategy and technology trends, so how we make things, how people use things, what's available, what works and what doesn't. And then what I like to call wildcards, which can be anything from terrorist attacks due to alien landings, things that we never, ever expect. And maybe we've got this wonderful two-year strategy and budget planned out, but if the economy crashes, then that could just be wiped out in an instant. These are things that very much echo what Matt was talking about yesterday with his essence and accident in software engineering. Change happens, and we need to make sure that the way that we go about creating things expects this. Now, many of us, I'm sure, already exist in the future a little bit daily, so we might anticipate new browser releases, new devices, we might check support through websites like this, we might bookmark ever-changing specs, and of course, we all come to conferences and we hear people telling us that we can and we should be using things. And hopefully by now, we know that we can't actually control who's going to be using our websites or the screens or the capabilities of the devices they're going to be using in the future. So responsive design and progressive enhancement are hopefully already on our minds. And this is a view that was shared by the Future Friendly Movement way back in 2012, and it still holds true today in the future from then. So they acknowledged some of the challenges that they knew we would be facing, and they have some ideas about how to work with the future. But let's consider it in a slightly broader context for a bit. As the people who make websites, we need to make a lot of selections around the technology that we're going to be using for our work. And as Sarah's talk yesterday showed us wonderfully, these are the choices that we make so we can turn to the dark side if we make tech choices for the wrong reasons. Like the people of the past, we're actually balancing the realities that we face today with these unknowns of tomorrow. Once we start making decisions, especially around our choices, we need to be mindful that even if they are right for us now, they may not be right in every situation in the future. So I started out as a developer. Uh, I was actually a back-end developer originally. But the thing that I really loved was focusing on helping people to really understand those problems and to match those with the different options that they might have. So my job now is very much as a solutions architect and a consultant, and I work a lot on transformation projects. And I, I spent three months last year working uh, with one of the big UK companies on a, a project where their systems were over 20 years old, and whilst they'd initially done a great job, at this point in time, they were really struggling to be able to keep up with either the business needs or their, their customer needs. And they're in this position where they had a huge amount of technical debt, and it's really hard for them to get developers who wanted to work with all these ancient technologies. Um, because of the mess that they had to deal with, any changes took six months to go from being suggested to actually being rolled out, which was just incredibly painful. And they got into that habit of kind of trying to roll out cosmetic changes. And I audited some of those. And you get the classic things of... Uh, extremely old versions of libraries being used, sometimes being included multiple times. And there were loads of accessibility issues due to horribly messy implementations. And of course, you, you start to get into this, um, the danger of having huge performance issues as well. Once you fall behind like this, 
it's really easy to let all of those limitations that you're facing absolutely drown you. So you're being crushed by this white elephant. And it's very easy to feel like you maybe need to just get rid of that elephant altogether and start again. Because all you're trying to do at this point is trying desperately to keep up, whereas what you really want to be doing is getting ahead. You want to be beating all of your competitors. So my client had got into this cycle of, oh, it's all broken and we should just throw it all out and start again, which in theory is great, and I think a lot of people think that that's a good solution. But when it comes to doing that in reality, it can be absolutely terrifying for people to leave behind everything they know. And when you get into this mentality, you also forget all of the good things that the technology has done for you over the years. And you instead start to focus on how overwhelmed you feel and how you never want to feel this again. So that meant that in my role on this project, uh, I was actually tasked with making the technology and uh, development approach recommendations. And they asked me, to pick solutions that would be able to meet needs for the next five to 10 years at least, which I'm sure you can imagine my response was something a little bit like this. <laughs> but of course, it's not just project problems, right? So a lot of the challenges around the future present themselves as problems for us as individuals. And as people who make websites, if we don't think about the future and you know, how cool it's going to be, uh, we can be the person potentially responsible for playing a large part in projects getting into this kind of a state. And it can also leave us really vulnerable to being blindsided or derailed by an expected change, or maybe becoming a little bit more undesirable as a professional. And I think that the other side of it is that it's very easy to feel overwhelmed because there's a lot out there right now. And if you start to factor in everything that we know is kind of coming but not quite here yet, then that can get pretty terrifying. So the future is hard. <laughs> there's a lot of change. There's a lot of unknowns out there. But luckily, due to the very nature of time itself, people have been dealing with this for many, many years now. One of the wonderful things about technology as we experience it in the present is that at some point it didn't exist, and it may only have been a concept in fantastic stories. So we can draw on this with our thinking about the future and to help us in our work. So many of the things that we take for granted now, like live translation or video calling or tablets or e-books, have been extremely frequently represented in sci-fi over the years, and we get references right back to the 1950s. And these are things that are very familiar to us, but they were mere fantasy at the time. And we can go much further, so there are much more fantastic concepts, things like this retrofuturism image, uh, which is called Subways of the Future, and thankfully it was not predicting our fashion choices based on that couple over there. <laughs> but this comes with a caption that basically talks about how Subways of the Future are going to use these pneumatically propelled gravity vacuum tube capsules, which are going to run underground at 240 miles per hour. And when we compare visions like this with work actually being done with companies like Tesla, it's really hard not to draw parallels. So Tesla are actually um, trying to look into uh, what they're calling kind of, well, it's, it's mass transit for high traffic city pairs. So they've got Los Angeles and San Francisco as an example. And the Hyperloop project, instead of 240 miles per hour, is looking at running at more like 700. And the problem is that once you start looking at the reality, things get more challenging, as we'd expect. So just because we can dream it up, it doesn't always mean it's possible. And the pneumatic vision in the previous slide is one thing that they've actually ruled out. But the, uh, the blog post here is really interested if you'd kind of like to know a bit more about what is possible. So with hindsight, we can actually start to identify li the limitations based on what we do know about technology. But that doesn't mean that dreaming about the future is a pointless activity. So just jumping back to my project, what we did was to start right at the beginning with the planning and discovery phases. We wanted to play with this idea of the future because it was such a critical point. And we had these technical conversations in our workshops that were both really heavily grounded in the limitations and the challenges that we knew we had to deal with. But also, we put them and the people that we were working with in completely fantastic situations as well to balance it up. Because stories can give human context to technology, how it's used, what problems it might have, and how people might react to it. 
we can actually envisage the implications of different tech scenarios and therefore help us to be better prepared for the future. There's a whole school of thought called design fiction, which is basically a method of critical design that uses stories to raise uh, questions about possible futures for design and the society. And so you can use it to, to look at things like the benefits and the challenges and, more crucially, the implications of any choices. And we want to imagine things in a human-led context rather than just purely engineering-led scenarios. So this is kind of a lot of what we do with our UX work, but it's specifically got one eye on the future. People will always project a lot onto the future, whether that's their hopes or their fears, and sometimes asking them to think about fantasy and about um, you know, these futuristic scenarios is actually really easier to find out what they really think rather than if you ask them about their very specific situations right now. And there's some really nice enablers for this. So this is, um, these are some cards from the Design Fiction Product Work Kit by Near Future Laboratory. And as you can see, you're challenged to think about your problems um, with different kind of scenarios in mind when you're planning a product. And you start to use these to tell stories around uh, the tech that you're working with. And so you think about wider social, uh, technological, environmental, economical, and even political considerations, which might seem a little bit overblown, but it's really interesting when you start to actually get people talking about these kind of issues. And then at a more granular level, um, you can think about your different approaches as well and challenge yourself to maybe build things differently. So these are constraints cards which were on Kickstarter a few years ago now. And they're really fun for this. I know the no JavaScript one is probably going to be incredibly unpopular here, but I think that it's worth kind of considering how these different approaches might impact differently on your project and on the wider uh, impacts of it. The important thing here from the work kit is that no matter how kind of crazy these conversations get, how futuristic, what you want to do is you want to bring them back to reality. So you want to find the atomic element, which is a concept that I think we're all quite used to working with now, um, the element that's going to make it successful. So whatever that key thing is that makes it work, that's what you really want to hone in on. So at this point in my project, this is when we started um, getting into putting together the solutions because we knew why things would be good or bad choices. And that's really quite interesting for how things uh, should work and what they should do, but when it comes to how things should look, everybody knows that the future is really all about cool interfaces, right? So Johnny showed us as much earlier. And there's been an excellent study undertaken by Christopher Noessel, who's got a book called Make It So, and it's got a supporting website called Sci-Fi Interfaces. And he's basically had the terrible job of spending a lot of time watching different TV shows and films and collecting together all of the different interfaces that are used within sci-fi and, crucially, providing lessons that we can actually learn from in the real world. So at the back of the book, they've got this collection where it looks at everything from mechanical controls to visual interfaces and gesture and much, much more. And they have this set of practical guidelines and opportunities because, as they state in the conclusion, We've seen repeatedly that if an interface works for an audience, there's something there that will work for users. Finding what that thing is and using it for inspiration in our own work is part of how we can use these speculative interfaces. An example they have in the book, which I really like, is um, the original set for Star Trek uses these very kind of physical interfaces. There's lots of buttons and these little plastic gems and things like that. And that was great, but then when they came to uh, fit the sets for the next generation, they not only wanted something that was going to look really futuristic and cool compared to this, but they were kind of on a tight budget, so it's the classic project, right? Want everything, but no money to pay for it. So they came up with a solution, which we now know as the LCARS interface, which is basically... Uh, some acetate that was printed on and backlit, and then you had all these people kind of, you know, doing touch with it. And this is actually one of the, the early things that really did popularize the concept of touchscreens. So through our choices, we can actually shape the future of technology ourselves. 
And if we think about responsive design, we do kind of take this a little bit for granted now, but if people like John Alsop and Ethan Marcotte hadn't gone, hey guys, this really makes sense, then we might not have got here quite as fast. So by aiming to anticipate the future, we can hopefully do all of this much better. We can better support our users, create better, more sustainable things, and shape technologies themselves. But how do we do it? Well, at this point on my project, we'd realized something that was really crucial. So this goal of having absolutely everything fit for purpose for however long in the future was just not realistic. And as I hope we all know from back to the future, the future is not just one point in time. It is a constant spectrum, and it's not the same for all of us. So our five-year future here may be very different to the five-year future for somebody on the other side of the world. And it's also very different based on individuals. So your situation may mean that it's a great move to switch your framework to whatever the latest hipster JS framework it is. Who knows today? There's always a new one. But somebody else might be really happy sticking with what they've got because it works. And their white elephant may not be the same. So it's also not the same for the different elements of our project as well. And within chemistry, the half-life of a subject is the time that it takes for half of the substance to decay. In the context of the web, a shorter half-life might mean more regular assessment and updating of a component, and a longer lifespan might be the elements that play more into our larger strategic thoughts. So when we come to choose our technologies, we should actually expect that someday they will be updated or superseded or need will change. And so this is going to be very different depending on the lifespan of the different aspects. Typically, elements of our projects that users interact with, uh, they're going to have a shorter lifespan than the technologies that very often power them. So when we think about the front end, we're actually right at the forefront of change. And if we're going to be tweaking our front end code to support some new feature or new API that's come out, then fantastic. But if we are swapping out our CRM after implementing something um, different last week, that's not so good. Uh, where lifespans are actually expected to be longer, the impact of change is typically felt much, much more. So expecting change at different rates becomes this really crucial key uh, to architecting well. And not all of the elements are obviously going to be under our control, but on the front end, we want to be making sure that work is as loosely coupled from other elements as possible, because what we don't want is we don't want the half-lives to start to impact on each other. And as an example, we don't want um, you know, your CMS dictating anything around your markup, if, if at all possible. And also thinking about this shorter lifespan of interfaces, things do move reasonably fast. And the concept of zero UI, or no interface, is becoming a lot more popular. And Andy Goodman has done some really good writing here. And one example that we used on my project to get people thinking about change was the really simple act of submitting a numerical reading periodically. So traditionally, this would probably uh, expect direct text input, probably from a physical keyboard. But now, of course, we have virtual touch keyboards. And for the most part, our input types probably still stand, but maybe we're going to make them a little bit nicer um, you know, by using input types. And what about voice? Or maybe we want the ability to perform character recognition uh, by capturing an image directly and processing it. And that might be through a phone camera, or maybe it's going to be through the internet-enabled retinal implants that we're all going to have in the future. Or maybe it'll even be thoughts. Who knows? So fundamentally, most stays the same. How we're storing the number stays the same. How we're capturing it and validating it probably still stays the same as well. But what's different is actually the way that we present the interaction to the user and how the capabilities that we can offer them will come and go. Because we need to be able to be flexible enough for these kind of enhancements, and we need to expect that people's expectations of us will change as well. So this concept of the different levels of the future is particularly important, and it's what we use to be able to actually come up with solutions for my client in the end. And it was much more about changing attitudes towards change than actually the technology itself. Because we need to think about the next sprint, and next month, the next six months, and the next 10 years, all at the same time, because they are all the future of our work. So to wrap up, 
Uh, in the next few slides, I've got a really quick summary, but please do come and have a chat if you'd like to discuss it in more detail, because there's obviously a lot that we want to talk about here. Um, so these things here are probably a mix of what you're already doing and things that maybe you're not that we've, we've sort of mentioned today. Um, so thinking about the future starts right at the start of our project. We've spoken about balancing the problems that we have now and the problems that might come in the future, and how we can use concepts like design thinking in workshops, and how we should think in terms of the different strategies for change and half-lives. And a really nice way to do this and to keep this in people's mind is by creating some project principles specifically around the future. And these are some that I did create for that project, which are extremely high level, but they focused on the specific challenges that they were facing again and again. And these will need to be customized to whatever you're facing, but they can act as a constant reminder for people to validate decisions against. I also really like this quote, which is something to think about when we put together our requirements. So we shouldn't try to predict technology and where that's going, but we might want to think instead about future problems and user needs and let that drive where we do want to go. And as with some of the design fiction cars, we want to consider some of the wider impacts as well. Now, when it comes to actually doing, so designing and building, we do want to think as modularly and atomically as we can, and we want to separate our concerns and to progressively enhance where possible. Shortening the future when we're building really does reduce the unknowns, but we also want to try to reduce our connection a little bit to now and think about where we could be. Because if we only live in the now, and we don't consider where things will go, then we, never, uh, we run the risk of never pushing our solutions. However, no amount of good planning or building will actually matter if you can't keep up with change, and this is where the white elephant can creep up on you very slowly. So we want to keep one eye on the future, but also on learning from what's happened before. We want to educate others about why change doesn't mean that we've failed, and it's something to be expected. We also want to play with new technologies, even if they're not quite ready for production yet. We want to become aware of them in advance so that we can better know when they might be applicable to our work. And finally, we could look at outside influences like sci-fi to help us become more creative with technology. I was actually at a conference last year where Andrew Pendrick spoke, and he told a story of wabi-sabi, which is quite a hard-to-translate Japanese phrase. But it basically describes a mindset of accepting transience and imperfection, and to embrace the beauty that those can actually bring. So it's things like um, fading autumn leaves, or it's the changing glaze in a teacup that comes from usage. And I think that it's also extremely relevant with our work for the web. So by accepting change as a necessity with our projects, and by not seeing it as failure or that we were wrong, if things do need to be swapped out, then we could start to identify the opportunities instead. Don't just see the unknowns and those imperfections of the future as something to be battled against, but as actually something that can help to push our work forwards. As my wise friend John says, don't plan for the future, because there is no future, just now and a series of next nows. So by embracing this fluidity, hopefully our projects will be a little bit better for it. Thank you very much. All right. Sally Jenkinson, everybody. Come on over. Let's have Thanks. a chat. Welcome to the couch. Thank you. That was... Fantastic. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid in the 80s and 90s, uh, <laughs> I think sci-fi and things like Johnny Mnemonic and the movie Hackers and the work of William Gibson and Philip K. Dick uh, really actually made me want to sort of do what I do today. Yeah. Uh, was that an influence for you in your career choices or like what you wanted to work on? Or? <sighs> Probably. I mean, it's, for me, it's kind of one of those things where if I think about things that I've spoken about before and things that I've kind of had in my work, just little intertwined sections, then it actually is quite a big part. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's kind of one of those things that I've never made that connection before now, and it yeah. is, but I, I just love all of that. And I think that a lot of people, you know, like I was saying, you can laugh at the terrible outfits and you know, all the kind of, uh, you know, all the references yeah. throughout that are just absolutely nonsensical. Yeah. And uh, I do love that, but there are also some really important lessons that we can learn from it as well. Oh, definitely. Uh, before you put the tweet up, I was like, in Johnny Mnemonic, didn't they have dial-up? Uh, where he like, goes to the hotel room and swipes a credit card, yeah. and I was like, I thought this was the future. But yeah. uh, have you seen the movie 
uh, Minority Report. I have, yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was, uh, sorry, I, I kept thinking about it sort of as you were speaking, because I think Steven Spielberg, before they shot the movie, uh, he actually got a group, uh, a think tank together, and tried to imagine what 50 years in the future would be. Uh, and so I like, love this idea that sort of like sci-fi uh, is always like painting a picture of what could be. Yeah. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong. And <laughs> well, with that, I think I particularly like, I may be getting it wrong, but um, yeah. from memory, that screen, you know, the, the classic thing where he sort of right. does all that, yeah. I think that existed or they, they did, you know, try to ground that in reality mm. as much as possible. Yeah. And the thing is, of course, that everybody kind of came along and went, I want that. I want everything <laughs> right. to do that. And so, you know, it was actually possible, but people were Definitely. sort of seeing it as very, very futuristic. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, that was the thing about the holographs in, the, in that movie, uh, specifically, is they didn't want them to be too clear or too good, because they were like, I don't think we're going to actually get it right in yeah. 50 years. Uh, but self-driving cars, you know, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we'll do it for a while. Uh, so, so you had a slide up there where you had uh, sort of your name tag, and then you had a picture of the Joker, <laughs> and I don't think you <laughs> talked about it at all. What was going on with the Joker? That was one of the workshops. That, <laughs> that was talking about, um, again, it was kind of the different ways that different people might approach technology and trying to think in terms of making decisions and why um, you, know, you pick a character and, and sort of talk about uh, the impact of tech choices and, and good things and bad things. And it, it, it was quite a fun game, but um, yeah. So I like, did not how, <laughs> go how, into how that the, too deep. How the Joker uses technology in his work is like those sort of like gags, you know, big giant guns that shoot down uh, bat, Batmobiles and stuff. Possibly. It's more kind of about the reali exploring the realities of the problems that you're facing and how um, trying to put yourself in a different mindset to yeah. your sort of your professional yeah. mindset, basically. Very cool. So in your work, uh, you said you, so your job is to help companies futurize, right? They, yeah, it's yeah. Part, of, part of it. Part of it. Are there any uh, sort of like uh, patterns that you're like sort of often seeing, uh, like sort of what kind of technology choices are you usually bringing into the future? It's more, because when people fall behind, it is it's very much about this fear, and it's mm. very much kind of, we need a new website, or, um, you know, this, this is really old, we need to just take this piece out and update it. But the problem is when you start to, look at it in isolation is very often um, the problem isn't just with the technology that you're using or your website is old and needs redesigning or anything yeah. like that. So um, it's, it's often kind of trying to speak to them about the wider elements as well. So right. the team that they have around it is the team being supported enough in terms of the skills that they have or right. the power that they have to make changes, you know, because yeah. a lot of the time you come in as an outsider and you don't want to be that person going, oh, you know, just just do this and just change that <laughs> because people are facing very different right. challenges in day to day. So it's kind so of it's about kind of supporting them as well. Definitely. So, so it's about getting them to think larger than the website. Yeah, and it's also about um, some, some of the processes that people have, which is the bit that I really like in terms of... Um, so I did a, a project last year for um, Higher Education College, and so they had this... Uh, we were basically looking at whether we could put applications and enrollments online, which is, in theory, quite simple because, you know, it's a load of forms and just storing the data, great. Um, but when it came down to it, we were sort of mapping out the process of what gets captured and where and how we might maybe optimize actually what's, get, you know, what's getting stored and what's getting transferred around. And we just came back to this part in the process where when somebody comes to enroll, they have to... Um, take some information and go and get a sticker. And so I was kind of like, what, what is this sticker? Because everybody is mentioning it like some mythical, special thing. And it turns out that in, I, I want to say in the olden days, it, it probably wasn't you know, so old, but they basically <laughs> had like a book and that book contained all the stickers and if you got a sticker, you had a place on a course. And that was why it was kind of so sacred and special. And so actually, nowadays, the sticker was absolutely meaningless, but it was this hangover from, you know, it, w yeah. it had such historical importance. And so it's trying to change those mindsets about the things that you sometimes think are really crucial and you can't get away from. Yeah. Um, you know, we can, we can make it much better with digital approaches. White elephants. White All elephants. Right. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're Ladies welcome. and gentlemen, Sally Jenkinson. Thanks. Thanks so much.